Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Privilege of mine today to be uh, bringing this message from the scripture. Uh, it is um, just always a, a joy to set into a new year and to begin to chart our course as we go. And so my prayer has been that as we spend this time uh, considering some scripture today, that you will be helped and uh, indeed you may be able to set a firm foundation for charting your course into 2023. How in the world did that happen? Today, uh, I want to spend some time in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, which is where you'll find the account of the Magi coming to visit Jesus. Now, we are several days away from Epiphany, which happens on January the 6th of every year. But I've sort of observed over the years that in the Church of the Nazarene, we don't follow too strictly to that timeline for uh, these early events of the church calendar. But I have, over the last couple of years, well, probably more than a couple of years, tried to bring emphasis uh, of the visit of the Magi in this first week following the beginning of the new year. And uh, so I want to do that today. The story is pretty remarkable in so many respects. And today, uh, I'm hoping that we will learn maybe something new together as we spend this time looking at the story. But also as we go digging in the Old Testament for a little bit of background, and the core question that I want you to consider today, the idea that I want you to consider, is um, this. Well, some of you heard me preach last Sunday on Christmas Day, and uh, I was suggesting that there was a bit of a distinction between simply being good, doing what is right, doing what is expected of us, and actually being actively engaging in obedience, uh, listening for the ways the Lord may be directing us at any moment in time, and being obedient. And uh, I want to maybe, I guess, build on that a little bit today and ask you this question. Have you ever considered that your acts of obedience today may set in motion events that might become profoundly consequential? That you may not even recognize, you may not even be alive for, but because you have chosen to be obedient in a situation right now, that there begins to be an unfolding of events and consequences that could be of remarkable measure. I'm just going to throw that challenge out to you this morning, because we're going to look at some who did just that. And we're going to begin by looking at this story about the Magi who come to visit Jesus. Just a couple of uh, details about them. We know that they travel across uh, the desert from the east, probably from where modern-day Iraq is now. Uh, we know that um, when they arrive in Jerusalem, it would have been quite a remarkable spectacle. And one of the details we'll read in a moment about uh, King Herod being uh, greatly alarmed uh, and the whole town, the whole city with him, uh, suggests that it was, it was perhaps quite a spectacle when they arrived in the city. And uh, we know that uh, these characters uh, end up playing a pretty central role on many of our Christmas cards through the years. But truthfully, we don't much know a whole lot about them. It's largely speculation. And so today I, I need to do some speculating with you. And that's always a bit dangerous. But uh, by the end of it all, um, I hope that you'll feel like I haven't gone too far afield. And that maybe, maybe I just may be onto something as we consider these characters. So let's, 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 let's read the story. I will today, though, pause at various moments in the reading of it, just so that we can build it out as we move along. So reading from Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. A couple of details that we need to just get clear before we go any further. We hear this reference of them coming to one who is known as King Herod. Uh, Herod the Great was his title. And um, he is a, a man of dubious historical details and, and not just scripture. There is historical accounting of his actions that are extra biblical uh, outside of the scripture that allows us to, to build a pretty strong, confident case about what we know of his character. He had uh, become 
uh, king of Jerusalem, D Judea rather, um, during a rather tumultuous time, the Roman Empire had spread across, and then there was a time when they were beaten back by, by the Parthians, and then uh, as Rome began to push its control again, Herod rather uh, dis uh, carefully and, and, and successfully uh, lobbied one character, historical figure by the name of Mark Anthony to uh, he persuade him that he would be loyal to Rome, and uh, under Mark Anthony's persuasion of the Roman Senate, they determined that this man who had been appointed uh, one of the uh, stewards, if you would, of the land, shall be declared the king of Judah. And so his, his title and his, and his role is, is owed entirely to the favor of Mark Anthony, uh, one of the great Roman leaders. What we also know about Herod from, uh, from, from evidence outside of the scripture is that there, if ever there was someone who was desperately jealous and fearful of his position as king or of rule or of his reign, his influence, it was this man. Uh, among the various things that we know from history that he did is he saw the, he saw, oversaw the assassination of at least six family members, including immediate family, one was his favorite wife, notice that favorite wife was killed because he suspected that she was plotting against him, and then also four of his sons, all because he thought that they were after his throne. So later, when we read in the story about him ordering that children under the age of two should be killed, it is so profoundly consistent with his character that while some would try to say that, oh, that's a crazy detail, that can't possibly been true, it, it, it absolutely can't not be true because of what we know from this Herod the Great. And so he is the one who received the Magi, these, these, these wise men, if you would, from the East. The Magi were a class of uh, not really religious leaders. Truthfully, they were more political advisors. Uh, they were tasked as scientists. I know that some will call them astrologers. Uh, that's probably just not a very fair characterization at all. Astronomers, yes, absolutely. They, they dedicated a great deal of their life in studying the stars. And you may recall that uh, back in, in, in ancient history, uh, at, the, at the earliest days of natural science, there was a great suspicion, expectation that, that the strange movement of the planets in the sky and their interaction with the stable stars uh, was evidence that there was something, something uh, beyond human knowing happening in a spiritual realm. And so these scientists of the stars looked to them uh, with an expectation that somehow, somehow, if they looked closely and studied hard enough, that they may be able to discern some of the, some of the movements, some of the intentions of the divine beings or being who oversaw that which they couldn't possibly understand in love themselves. So to call them astrologers in the modern sense of that definition is, is, is way too big of a leap. What we do have to accept though that they, as astronomers or scientists, they were nevertheless really profoundly influenced by, uh, by a mystical interpretation of the interaction between the natural order and the divine realms. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Uh, we need to credit them with, with, with an objectivity in their study that befits a scientist, but we do need to also allow that they had a specific task that was, what is God or what are the gods trying to say to us? And so in that sense, there is that blur which sometimes wants to make them into astrologers. I just don't think that's a very fair assessment of them. Nevertheless, they have seen a star, a particular star, a star that in their mind has triggered a hunger, that I'm going to tell you a little later, was seeded deep into them in some ancient times of history. Uh, and, and this idea that, okay, God is speaking and we need to respond. And so they set out on this journey in response to what they have seen in the sky. And they come across to Jerusalem and they say quite emphatically <laughs> to King Herod, by the way, I, I think it almost a certainty that they knew his reputation. That they, they, they knew the character, they knew how ruthless he was and, and how willing he was to strike people down. And nevertheless, 
buoyed by their conviction that they had seen some remarkable symbol from God, they went to him and they said, we're here because we saw a symbol of a new king. And needless to say, Herod wasn't happy about it. Verse 3 says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Now you know what disturbed means. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. And the response after this great council was in Bethlehem, in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. And then they quote from the prophet Micah uh, in the Old Testament. Micah wrote, But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. So then at verse 7 it says that Herod called the Magi secretly. I love those little details that can slide past our imaginations. He calls them secretly. And found out from the exact time that the star had appeared. Notice the past tense there, by the way. Even in the first one, they, they, they said that, 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 that they had seen, past tense, a star in the east and have been led here to Jerusalem. And now again, they, he wants to know when the star had appeared. I think that's perfect tense, if I'm not mistaken, an event that had happened in the past and has, and has been completed. So I think we probably need to allow that they were not led by the star across the desert, but they'd seen the sign somehow, and I'll tell you my idea in a moment, somehow knew that they needed to go to Jerusalem, made their way across, and explained that they had come because they had seen a star, and that indicated to them something great and marvelous was happening. And so uh, Herod wants to know when that star had appeared, and then it says in verse 8 that he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. You've got to think that anybody who might have been in that room, that secret meeting, listening to Herod make that promise that he would go and worship as well. If they knew anything about Herod, and if they were in the room, they probably did, uh, they knew he was bald-faced lying. Verse 9 says, After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And says the verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. It's like, there it is again, there it is. This confirmation that their journey was not going to be fruitless. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and they worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented them with gifts of gold, Incense, myrrh. Verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I, I can't prove this, but I, I wonder, and I think that they may have had that dream, that warning to not return to Herod, even before they saw the child. It doesn't really matter. But I'm imagining a timeline like this, that they leave that council with Herod, they know in their gut that something is not right here. I, I wonder if they, they then had this dream that said, don't, whatever you do, don't go back to him. And then I imagine that they wake and they see the star again. And God reveals this to them again in the same way that he called them out of that land. And, and there they go off overjoyed and finding the child and worshiping him and presenting him their gifts and then hightailing it out of town. A, a different route. I don't know. Uh, just trying to piece together the story. I love the interaction of the dreams here. If you want to do some uh, extra reading for this occasion, you can go back to the start of how Matthew begins with Joseph. And you'll see that uh, he comes to Joseph in a dream and he warns the uh, Magi in a dream and then he warns Joseph in a dream and says, get out of here and get to Egypt. And just it's just, uh, it's interesting how many dreams are used in the storyline, and that's probably a really good segue for me to go to an Old Testament passage that uh, I want to explore here, because I want to ask this question. Why in the world, why in the world 
with these characters from a far off land who are not in the hub of Jerusalem's influence and therefore the influence of the Jews, why would they make this incredibly dangerous trek across the desert, present themselves to a ruthless, bloodthirsty, jealous king, and, and, and follow through with all of these, these, like why would they even do that? If you would, put your finger back in that passage and slide over to me to the book of Daniel foretold by Isaiah, fulfilled in the time of, Jeruz of Jeremiah, Israel is sacked, uh, the Babylonians march, and part of their way of weakening the people is to extract from uh, the conquered people key leaders and influential persons and take them out so that, the, so that the, the land they've conquered is left leaderless and weak, but also taking some of these sharp, uh, powerful, influential persons back and, and forcing them to serve in their context as well. And that's what happens to Daniel. And if you, we're going to skip really, really fast, but in Daniel chapter 1, uh, we, we read this, that the king ordered uh, his, his, his chief of the court officials to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing ap aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. And Daniel, along with three others, is uh, chosen to serve in the king's service because of his, his, his aptitude and his, and his wisdom. And uh, we learn right away of Daniel's determination to honor the Lord and to honor everything that he had understood was required of him as a servant of Yahweh, some of which was the observance of very careful food-eating restrictions so that when the Babylonian king comes and gives to them all the food to make them strong and robust, Daniel sees food there that he doesn't feel like he's supposed to eat, and he refuses to, and, and uh, God blesses him and allows him to, be, to flourish even with a very modest diet. But here's what happens. King Nebuchadnezzar has dreams. And on one occasion, he has a dream that horrifies him. And uh, he calls one after another the Magi, the wise men those who were tasked with searching the skies for answers, and those who had apparently been given the ability to interpret dreams. And he calls them one after another, tell me what I dreamed, and then interpret it for me. And the reality is, is that they're not able to, and they're so not able to, that they actually begin to sort of tell him, fill him sort of news and information that uh, they think he wants to hear, and it enrages the king, and he orders that they be killed for their, for their, you know, inability to interpret his dream properly and to just uh, do a little bit of schmoozing with him. Daniel learns that uh, this is happening, and he actually requests an audience with the king and goes in and volunteers to, 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 to tell the king about his dream and to interpret it for him. And this happens, and if you go into chapter 2 of Daniel, you'll be able to read all about it. And Daniel goes into extraordinarily detail of what the king would have seen in his dream. And, and it's, it's splendid and it's marvelous and it's full of all kinds of strange imagery. And, uh, and, and, and you can just, if you're there, imagine the king's eyes just like, because he's hearing back exactly what he heard or saw in his dream. And Daniel then goes on to provide an interpretation that is um, uh, not profoundly unflattering to the king, but it's not over, overdone. And he talks about how other kingdoms are going to rise up that will be lesser or greater than him and, and uh, foretells a future that uh, doesn't see this king, Nebuchadnezzar, reign forever or even for long. And uh, the king is profoundly moved. Daniel says to the king, the great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Chapter 2, verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, and he paid him honor, and he ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. 
Now, listen to this. This is so incredibly significant. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made Daniel ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men, all the Magi. Daniel in charge of all of the Magi. <laughs> okay, so Daniel has already demonstrated his determination that he's not going to break with the food laws. And we get another story about him a little bit later on when uh, someone who's jealous of Daniel's position tricks the king into forming an idol that all the people were supposed to bow down to and worship. And Daniel refuses to do that on risk of being thrown to the lions. And in fact, uh, when the king learns that he hasn't and has made this decree, he's sort of captured and he has no choice but to be uh, held uh, accountable to his own law, throws Daniel into the den with the lions. And of course, if you know the story, uh, the, the lions don't harm him. This man who is so utterly determined to be faithful to his God, no matter if it cost his life, now that he's been placed as the leader of the Magi, do you think for a moment that he was hesitant about telling this group of advisors to the king that the God who interprets dreams, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, will one day send a deliverer who will be the king of all kings. I am speculating, but on a pretty confident base, that in the rest of Daniel's influence as the leader of the Magi to that generation, he vested them with the promises of God that were a part of the scriptures, that were a part of everything that he had learned, this confidence that one day, even though right now he's living in a land far away from the promised land, that one day God would act into history and that they needed to watch for that day. Watch the stars, listen to the dreams. And one day, some generations later, a group of them tasked with discerning the wisdom of the gods as they moved through the skies, conferred together about a star that they were seeing and said together, I wonder if this is what has been passed on to us that the God or the gods, however they would have seen it in their perspective, has delivered this king of kings. And they were persuaded. And they set out on that trip and they arrived. And on coming to the child, they fell down and they worshiped. Okay, so I hope I've painted a compelling narrative. Don't think I strayed too far from the scripture. Could Daniel have possibly known that his determination to be faithful, even to a group of people who were not declaring their fidelity to Yahweh, but he would be faithful to what God had called them to do and to be and to proclaim. And, and certainly he had notoriety in his day. He even gets a Bible book written after him. But might he have possibly known that hundreds of years later, the, the descendants of the men that he would have poured himself into with this new privilege as, as the influencer and the overseer of all the Magi, that one of their descendants would arrive on the scene and be marked by such a significant epiphany of God's desire that the world would know that now he has come to save his people. What might your obedience today set in motion to be felt by the next generation, the generation after that? 
This is a story filled with so much faithfulness, so much determination to, 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 to do exactly what God was calling them to do. Uh, so much risk in every instance, whether we're talking about Daniel or the Magi who traveled and went past the bloodthirsty king, they were all risking their lives to be obedient. They just knew they needed to be obedient in the moment. Could they possibly have known the consequences of their actions? I don't think so. I don't think so. And so with that, I, I, I want to just throw it at you. Could you dare imagine that your obedience today could be profoundly consequential? in the lives of your children, your children's children, or your neighbor's children, or your sister's children, or, or what, like, like what we do today makes a difference, even when we don't get to see it. And so here, at the start of a brand new year, let's all be determined to be faithful to the direction that God is giving to us. We may not get to see the fruits of that faithfulness, it may cost us a whole lot for some, probably not in Canada, but for some, that kind of obedience will cost them their lives. But the consequence, because it's obedience to the Lord God Almighty, who is uh, the, the, the author of life and the keeper of the timeline and the one whose story is being told and will be told to his glory. I pray that uh, these next months will be rich in your own discovery of God's call upon your life and uh, the direction that he's given to you. Lord bless you. Have a good day.